Good morning. Scripture lesson today is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 9. Okay, before we read, uh, let us pray for illumination. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 16. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could, not, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hand on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sister Eileen. We are continuing in our series again this morning on Christian myths and fables. And we're talking about basically myths, you know, beliefs that we Christians sometimes hold, which may or may not necessarily be so true, but somehow we live as though they are true. And so we're going to continue this series. So take out your sermon notes with me, and let's go to the Lord in prayer before we start. Hallelujah. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Savior, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise, all honor and all glory. And we ask, Lord, this, evening, this morning that your Spirit come and speak to us. Your Spirit come and minister to us. Lord, that you will open our eyes and our ears to hear from you, to understand from you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Well, I think we're continuing our series of myths. And a myth is basically some, an idea which we believe, but is not entirely true. It could be 50%, 20%, 30% true, but not entirely true. And like most myths, they actually have a certain amount of truth attached to those myths. For example, you know, these are some of the common myths that mothers always tell us when we were growing up. But, well, there are some truth you'll find in it. The first is, chicken soup cures cold. It's a myth. But scientists have discovered that chicken soup can actually reduce inflammation by slowing down the white blood cell activity respons responsible for causing that inflammation. I don't know how true that is. Ask the doctors around. Number two, fish is brain food. Well, you know, mothers always say, eat your fish, it's good for you. 
Well, a recent Harvard study found that the more fish that mothers ate during their second trimester of pregnancy, the better their babies did on tests when they were six months old. Okay, and we know nowadays, right, they always sell baby milk powder, but DHA, AHA, also, also HA that comes with baby, I mean, that comes from the fish. Third, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, a 2013 study found that if all people aged 50 and above in the UK ate just one apple per day, they would actually prevent or delay 8,500 heart attacks and strokes a year. I don't know. Number four, a prolonged and difficult labor means it's a baby boy. Don't laugh. In 2003, an Irish study, they studied over 8,000 births and pregnancy and births, and they found that somehow the boys just took longer to, to deliver than the girls. They do not know why. They suspect maybe because boys, their head has a slightly larger circumference compared to the girls. I don't know if that's true or not. But that's what they found in an Irish study in 2003. Fifth and last, a hot bath prevents pregnancy. A hot bath prevents pregnancy. Well, in 2007, scientists, they did, they did a study and they discovered that actually when you are, when they call it wet heat exposure in like hot tubs, jacuzzi and things like that, actually reduces the sperm count. It actually reduces it. I don't know how true it is, but that's what is, a study has found. And so, there are some truths in myths sometimes. Not all myths are completely baseless. And likewise, the myth that, the myth that we're going to see today, the myth that God wants me to be happy. You know, there's a myth, but really often times there is some truth to this myth. There is some truth to it. And I don't know how often I hear Christians use this phrase to justify what they are doing, to justify most of their actions. You know how many times Christians will come and say, you know, I can do this because God wants me to be happy. I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't want to get involved in that. I don't want to serve in that area because I'm doing what I do now. God wants me to, I'm happy with what I'm doing now. God wants me to be happy. Or sometimes they say, it's okay if I do this. Or it's okay if I press on with this relationship. It's okay if I get involved in something that I know, I, I, I mean, I'm not so, it's not so maybe it's questionable, but it's okay I do it because I'm happy when I'm doing it. And God wants me to be happy, right? I remember a man, uh, uh, this is an actual, actual case. A man came up to me, he's, he was, he's having an affair, and he came up to me and he says, I, he, I will continue in the relationship. I said, why? Because I'm happy when I'm in a relationship. I'm happy with her, and I'm not happy with my wife. I'm happy with her, and God wants me to be happy, right? And many times we use it that way. You know, mothers, sometimes I know mothers who will be so busy with their career, and when things at home fall apart, because they have no time for family, no time for husband, no time for anything, and when things at home fall apart, they say, no, 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 I will not give up my career because I'm happy there. It makes me feel fulfilled. It makes me feel happy. And God wants me to be happy, right? And so over and over again, I hear this phrase that people say, God wants me to be happy. And sometimes somehow we have this idea that God doesn't ever want us to do something that will make us unhappy. Or God never wants us to do something that we don't really like. Well, there is some truth to it in the sense that yes, God does want us to be happy. Like in Ecclesiastes 5.19, it says here, Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables them to enjoy it, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. In other words, God's gift is for us to be happy. But do you know, happiness as defined in the Bible is oftentimes very different from what we know. For instance, like Psalms 1 verse 1, it says this, Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight in the law is in the law of the Lord and on His law they meditate day and night. And you see, happiness in God's terms is very different from what you and I sometimes understand happiness to be. In fact, would you write with me the first point of your note is this. God wants me to be happy eternally instead of happy temporarily. God wants me to be happy, yes, but God is more concerned about our eternal happiness than in our temporal happiness. And many times we gauge happiness based on what 
will make me happy now? What makes me joyful now? What makes me en- what, what I enjoy doing now? And it all depends a lot on how we see things. Because we see things as things that don't make me happy, they're bad for me. Things that makes me happy, I like. It's good for me. And we want the things that make me happy. And it just depends a lot on how we see things. You know, there was this story of this, this man. He was, he was in a coma. He's been sick badly and he's in a coma for many days, sleeping in and out of coma, in and out, in and out. And throughout the whole time, his loving wife was sitting right next by him in the hospital, just taking care of him the whole time. And suddenly one day, he finally came through and he woke up and he saw his, love, his, his wife sitting there next to him. And he looked at his wife and he said, Oh, my dear wife, you know, you've been with me through all the bad times in my life. When I first got fired from my job, you were there with me. And when I went into business and I failed in my business, you were there with me. When my business partner cheated me out of all my money, you were there with me. And when we lost the house, when the mortgage failed and we lost the house, you were still with me. And when we were walking down the street together and the robber shot me to mark me and and he shot me and I nearly lost my life, you were there with me. And then when my health started to fail and I became, and, and my health failed and I keep falling sick, you were still there with me. And now when, and he took his wife's hand and he said, now when I look at it, and I think about all those times, I think you bring me bad luck. <laughs> it depends on how you see things, right? It depends a lot on how you see things. And oftentimes we don't see happiness the way God sees it. We see it in its immediate value. We don't see it in the unseen, eternal value. And that's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, he says this, For our light affliction, our current suffering, is for a moment. It's working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, of joy, of happiness. While we do not look at the things which are seen, the immediate, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary. And the things that are not seen are eternal. And that's what God is saying, you know. You know, it's sometimes, sometimes the light afflictions that we have to go through, sometimes the pain that we have to go through, sometimes the suffering that we have to go through, sometimes the discomfort, the things that we don't like to do, the things that we don't enjoy, the things that will make us unhappy in the immediate, those things has eternal value. And we need to realize that. You see, friends, because more than being happy, God wants us to be healthy. More than being happy, God wants us to be whole. And and to understand that, to understand that, you need to write, write the second point of your notes is this. We need to understand the difference between hurt and harm. We need to know the difference between hurt and harm. There's a huge difference. And many times we think that whatever hurts me, harms me. But it's a huge difference actually. You see, hurt is something that will make us sad, that will make us feel pain, that will make us feel bad, but it doesn't necessarily cause damage to us. Harm, on the other hand, whether it may or may not cause pain, it may or may not cause sadness, but it will bring damage, either now or in the long term. For example, I mean, you see, for example, not everything that is hurtful is harmful, and not everything that is harmful is necessarily hurtful. For example, let's, let's think myself. You all know, right, I love to eat steaks. I love steaks, okay? And I love all sorts of red meat, like about beef, mutton, steaks, all this. I love it. It's delicious. And the juicier and the fatter it is, the more delicious it is. And... Imagine, if I were to one day eat, not just a steak, but I were to eat a whole cow. I trust, trust me, I'll eat every part of the cow. The sirloin, the tenderloin, the T-bone, the ribs. Oh, especially the ribs. I tell you, when I was preparing this sermon, and, I, and I, was talking, I was looking at the parts of the cow, and I saw the ribs, and I just remembered, I tell you, this is the, the, my memory just flashed back. One of the best ribs I ever had is what we always call fall off the bone ribs. You know what it means? 
Basically, they cook the whole rack of ribs there. You just pick up the bone, the meat all just falls off automatically. And not that. You cut a piece, you put it in your mouth, it literally melts and dissolves in your mouth with all the fat and juice and flavour just filling your entire mouth. I tell you honestly, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm getting hungry just thinking of it. But unfortunately, I don't, I don't know of any good ribs in Malacca. I have to go all the way to KL to get some. Okay, and, but imagine if I eat ribs, and not just one cow's ribs, I eat 20 cows of ribs. Will it, I mean, will it hurt me? No. I will enjoy every bit of it. I will enjoy every mouthful of it. I will enjoy every moment of it. But will it harm me? You bet it. That amount of red meat, imagine the harm, the damage it will do to my cholesterol, to my blood pressure, to my uric acid, to whatever else in my body. It will cause such irreparable damage to me that even though I may not feel it immediately, but in 20 years down the road, I may probably die of a heart attack, if not immediately. You know? And so, it, 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 doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt me, but it brings a lot of harm. In fact, let me put it this way, if you prevent me from eating it, if you prevent me from eating ribs and steaks, that hurts me, that will hurt me. I tell you honestly, I've been, very good. I've been a very good boy lately. I've been getting more healthy in my diet. I've been eating a lot of fruits and vegetables. You can ask my wife. I've been eating sometimes just salad for lunch or just fruits for dinner and I've been, I've been eating a lot, a lot healthier. And let me tell you this, okay, you can ask my wife. Every now and then, I will tell her, you know, after, after having my meat deficiency, my red meat deficiency, I will actually, literally, I'm telling you, I'm not joking, literally, I will feel hurt and pain in a sense that my teeth will feel very itchy. You all believe it or not that teeth can feel itchy? I'm honest, I'm honest. My teeth will feel so itchy, I feel like I have to chew on something. And my mom will say, chew chewing gum lah. But that's, it doesn't fit, the texture is not right, the pressure, you just, and I just feel so itchy, I can literally like, ah, yeah. you know, it, it hurts, it hurts. But is, is it harmful? No, it's beneficiary, beneficial. Likewise, you know, sometimes we go to see the dentist, you know, it's hurtful, right? When you all see the dentist, my girl recently went to see the dentist to get a, a tooth pulled out because her, new, her, her milk teeth was still there, but the new teeth was growing up. And so we went to the dentist to pull out the teeth. And you're sitting there fearful. And after they pull it out, when they inject the, inject the anesthetic, she was in pain because the needle went in. Ouch! And then when they pull it out, after a while, the, 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 the whatever anesthetic goes away, she feels the pain. And she was like, ow, it's so painful, so uncomfortable, so painful. It hurts. But is it harmful? No. In fact, she needed it. Because if she doesn't go through that hurt, the two teeth growing out, that will cause more damage to her life. And so that is what it is. So somehow we, somehow we know that thing. Somehow we know this concept. We know this concept. We know this concept when it comes to, our, to raising our children. We know, we always tell them, you know, what, sometimes I may do things that hurt you, but it doesn't harm you. Or sometimes I have to hurt you in order to prevent harm from coming upon you. It's like this. Imagine my daughter. One day she would be running across, she, 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 she ran across the road. And the bus is coming down the street. The minute I, 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 because she's running too far, I couldn't grab her. All I can grab is her hair. And I grab that hair and I pull that hair with all my might. Imagine she falls back, she hits on the road, she gets bruises everywhere and her hair has a big bald spot over there because of the pain of it. And she look at me, Daddy, why you cause me so much hurt? You hurt me, you cause me pain. Why are you so bad? But then I'm preventing her from having worse harm. And if you ask me, if that happens again, I will do it again, and again, and again, and again. It doesn't matter how much hurt I will inflict on her, I will keep inflicting those hurts to prevent her from harm. Likewise, friends, we know that. And likewise, God also knows that. For us, we are His children. And look at Paul. When Paul says that to his children, Paul in 2 Corinthians 7, 8, he was telling his Corinthian church that he's his spiritual children. And he says this to them, for even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while, now I rejoice 
Not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. And somehow we understand this truth. We know the difference between hurt and harm. But we understand it for our children and sometimes we seem to forget it when it comes to our own life. And we tend to desire the things that, although it may not be hurtful, but it's very harmful to us. And the things that, although it may be very hurtful, but it's beneficial, yet we will reject it. Because we just want to think, we think that a happy life is a life without pain, a life without hurts, even if that hurts bring good. God, on the other hand, is not looking for you to have just a happy life. God, on the other hand, wants, doesn't want to, He knows that letting us avoid all the hurts in life will not bring us to a happy life. He knows that in order for us to have an eternally happy life, we need to deal, we need to build, he need to deal with the flaws in our lives. He needs to deal with the character issues in us, with the habits that we have, with the, with the attitudes that we don't, where it's not right, with our mindsets that it's not right. And God knows he has to deal with those things. And to deal with those things, if he needs to bring pain, he will bring pain. Because God knows, would you write me the next point in your notes, that we are all work in progress. We are all work in progress. None of us have already reached it there. None of us have attained. None of us has completed. We are all still work in progress. It doesn't matter how old you are, whether you're 7 years old or you're 70 years old, you are still work in progress. And God needs to work in those things. There's so many things that God needs to work in, in our character, in our love, in our thoughts, in our deeds. And there's just so many things. Not, and because, because all of us, we started out wrong. You know, when we, when we were born in this world, we started out with all this neg- negativity, all these negative, these, these damaged things. Not because we are evil, not because we are, we, we, but, but just because we are born sinful and we are born into a sinful environment, we are born in that way. And that's why, you know, this is a report by the Minnesota Crime Commission in January 1926. Minnesota Crime, it's, it's a circular study by a state in the US, it's a circular study Nothing to do, nothing spiritual. But listen to what they discovered. You know, they, they studied uh, the crime commission. They're trying to find out, figure out about how crime, how to reduce crime, what causes crimes and things like that. And this is one of the statements they said. They said that every baby starts life a little savage. He's completely selfish and self-centered. Isn't that true? Have you ever seen a selfless baby? Every baby is born selfish and self-centered. He wants whatever he wants and he wants it now. He wants his milk, he wants it now. He wants his bottle, he wants it now. He wants the mother's attention, he wants it now. He wants your father's watch, he wants it now. He wants to bite uh, the, 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 the cloth, he wants to bite it. And whatever the baby wants, he wants it now. And when you deny the baby these things, he seeds with rage, he seeds with aggressiveness, which can actually be murderous if he was not a helpless baby. If he was not a helpless baby, it would actually be murderous. But thank God for many parents who nurture the the babies well. Because you see, in all babies, they grow up, when they are born, they grow up, they they are dirty, they have no morals, they have no knowledge, and they have no developed skills. Which basically means that all children, not just certain children, but all children are born delinquent. If permitted to continue in their self-centered world of infancy, given free reign to their impulsive actions to satisfy each one, every child would grow up a criminal, a thief, a killer, and a rapist. This is a big change here, paradigm shift, you know, from saying that my child is born good and when he grows up bad, it's because I failed to, to, to train him. By saying that no child are born, they are prone to, ev- they are prone to the evil. It's up to us to direct and nurture them to the right way. You see the difference? And, let's, and that's what God knows about each and every one of us. We may not be inherently evil in the sense that we want to murder and kill everybody, no. But there's always this self-centeredness. There's always this selfish desires, this, this, this uh, rebelliousness in us. And God knows we are all born with this. And God needs to deal with it. And this is a work in progress. And, if we, and God knows if you leave us the way we are, then we will continue to go through life 
probably with broken marriages or broken relationships. We will go through life depressed, angry, disillusioned, and, we'll, and all these things will bring greater harm to us. And God has a, such a greater plan for us that He doesn't want us to go through a life that is damaged, a life that is full of harm. And if He has to hurt us in order to get us on the right track, He will do it. Because we should write me the last, the next point is that pain is an integral, integral part of that maturing process. Pain is an integral part of that maturing process. You can't mature in your faith without going through pains and hurts. Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His suffering. This is what Paul says. Paul says, I want to know Him and I want to share in Christ's sufferings so that I'll be like Him in His death. And so, somehow, to attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul knows that if I want to be like Jesus, if I want to become like Him, if I want to have His, his spiritual character, His spiritual authority, then I need to share in His sufferings. I need to go through that pain, that pain of the maturing process. And in fact, the passage that was just read by our dear sister Eileen, that was telling us the story of Paul. Paul was persecuting the Christians. He wanted to murder every Christian that's available and he thought he was doing it for God. He loved God and he thought that, by, that to love God means to kill Christians. And many of us today, we see that in the world today. A lot of people, they sincerely love God, but they're just misguided. And Paul, when he was on the road to Damascus, when he was on the road to Damascus, Jesus appeared to him, made him blind, scared the living daylights out of him. He got so fearful, he got so blind, all his mindset, everything was thrown, whatever he thought was true, was turned out to be false. And he became a desperate man, he became disillusioned, he became disappointed, he became helpless. When he was blind, he was totally helpless. And God, and God had to do that. Because in order to mature Paul from Saul to become Paul, God had to inflict that pain. That hurt. He had to go through that pain of being helpless. And that's why Jesus said in Acts 9, 9 verse 16, I myself will show him, Paul, I, Jesus saying, I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Friends, many times we shun suffering, we shun pain, we shun things that we don't like to do because we think that happiness means avoiding all this. But that brings more harm. And when we learn to embrace this pain and this suffering, we may hurt a while, but it brings eternal happiness and not temporal happiness. You know, it's like in a desert, you know, in a desert area, there's, a, there's, there's something they call chaparrals. Chaparral. Chaparral is basically, you know, in, in a large desert-like areas where there's a small area that's full of short-growing bushes, scrubs and bushes, you know? That's a, that, in a, in a midst of desert. And scientists have discovered, you know, that because, because this, this area is so dry and these shrubs and bushes will always grow there, they catch fire very easily. They will suddenly just catch fire and the whole place will burn. And then everything will die and new shrubs will grow again. Fire burn and they will die, new shrubs will grow again. And scientists discovered that for these, these shrubs, these, these bush-like plants, that for them to actually grow, for their seed to actually grow and to germinate, that their seed has actually a very hard outer shell. That it actually requires fire to burn away that outer shell of the seed so that what's inside can finally grow out. And so you see, friends, sometimes in life, fire is needed in our lives to burn away the dross in us, to burn away the things in us, that, that our weaknesses and the things that, 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 that prevents us from coming to God and to the things that prevent us from being like God. You need, you need to burn it all away so that the new things in us can grow out. It's like going to the dentist again. It's like pulling out the tooth. It hurts so badly. But unless the tooth is pulled out, the new teeth will not grow. The new teeth can't grow. And likewise, the flaws in us, it needs pulling out. And it will sometimes hurt. And trust me, sir, friends, it will hurt badly. But it is necessary because, which you write my next point, is that God's voice is often loudest through pain. God's voice is often loudest through pain. Job 33 verse 15 says this, In a dream, in a vision of the night, when the deep sleep falls on men as they slumber in their beds, 
he may speak in their ears and terrify them with warnings. You see, friends, in other words, you know, God will speak with us in ways that are gentle, in our dreams, in our visions, or he may speak in ways by whispering in our ear, or he may speak in ways that are terrifying. Why? Go on to the next verse. To turn man from wrongdoing and to keep him from pride, to preserve his soul from the pit, his life from perishing by the sword. You see, why does God have to bring pain and has, why God has to say give terrifying warnings? To prevent a man from wrongdoing, to keep his soul from the pit. So it's so easy for us to get used to doing wrong, to, to, get, to get so used with our weaknesses and our flaws that we no longer realize them. And when God whispers to us, we don't hear. When God speaks softly, we don't recognize until God has to shout and then we realize. Sometimes we can just get so used to things, you know. I remember when I was working back in the corporate world in our factory. Our factory was we quite, quite, a big, quite a huge floor space. I can't remember how big it was, but it was huge. And it's not so easy to get in and out. You know, to get in, sometimes to cross through the production floor or what, just to get out of the building because it's a huge building. And we often have this fire drill. You know fire drills, right? They will ring the bell, cling, and everybody has to line up and go to the padang there. And, and because our building was so huge and it was so, there were about 1,000 over people there, it takes about a few hours just to finish off a whole fire drill. By the time we get out and do the head count and everything and send everybody back in, we will waste hours of work. And so many of us, we don't like fire drills. And so many times, when the alarm goes off, and not once in a while, the fire alarm will go off, and we will just get so used to it, we say, we, we, don't, we, don't even, we don't even bother that the alarm goes off. We'll just continue our work. We'll continue our work and say, got fire, man. Ah, yeah, never mind, like, got fire. All of us burn already. We all die already. And we just continue work doing our work because we just don't like fire drills. And there's many times this happens. And the only time it will get us to get up of our seat and move out is when the manager comes and says, hey, it's a drill. All of you get out. Then they will start moving. And sometimes we are like that, right? In our lives. The alarm bells will go ringing, but we just ignore. We just don't realize. We get so used to all these alarm bells that it no longer bothers our head. And sometimes God will have to speak louder and louder and louder until He brings hurts. Sometimes God has to disallow a promotion. Or God has to allow some people to say some really hurtful things to you in order to wake you up. Or sometimes God will cause you to lose some money in investment. Or God will cause you to fail in a project. Or God will cause you to allow you to suffer shame in certain things in your life so that you will realize what God is trying to say to you. It's like a slap just to wake you up. And Hebrews 12, 11 tells us, now discipline always seem painful rather than pleasant at the time. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. All discipline at first, when God, when God slaps us, it won't feel nice. It will pain. But when we recognize the slap, because God's voice is loudest when He slaps us, and when we recognize it, and when we return to Him, He embraces us with open arms. Like the father of the prodigal son, He embraces us with open arms, and He restores us. Whatever that we have lost through the slap, whatever that we have lost through the hurts, God will restore. But in the midst of that, not only does He restore what we have suffered, what we have lost, but we have also gained a heart of righteousness. We gain a discipline. We gain a knowledge of God. We gain a new insight of God. And so not only do we restore what we lost, but we also gain a blessing from the Lord. Remember, friends, God is more interested in who we are becoming than what we are doing. And the same goes back to Paul. Remember the story of Paul? He was walking on the road to Damascus. Why does that have to happen? Very simple. Because although Paul loved God, Although Paul in his heart says, I want to be a follower of God. But yet Paul was doing it the wrong way. He didn't recognize his own weaknesses. And even though God has warned him many times, you know, he, he would have seen, the Bible tells us he was sitting at the, at the feet when people were stoning and killing Stephen. He was sitting there and he was collecting their cloaks. I hold your cloak for you so that you can stone a person. And in the midst of that, you know, Paul would have felt something is not right about murder. But yet his heart did not ring. The warning bells did not ring loud enough. 
And when he continued to persecute the Christians, he continued to, 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 to excel even further in murdering and killing. The warning bells did not ring hard enough. When he arrested people and he saw people like Stephen when dying with so much peace and so much joy in his face, yet the warning bells did not ring loud enough. Until Paul was on the road to Damascus, Jesus had to appear and bring pain into his life, making him so helpless before he realized. Many, many stories of such in the Bible. Another example is Samson. Samson, you know the big strong man in, Sam, in the Bible, in the book of Judges? He too. You know how he died, right? He, was, he, was, he met a girl named Delilah and he listened to Delilah. So man, remember the lesson. What happens when you listen to Delilah? And he got arrested and he got his eyes gorged out and he was hanging on tight to two poles. And in the midst of that pain of being blind and bitten by the people, he cried out to God and God restored his strength. God heard him and restored his strength. But what, what, what took Samson to be in that situation? In his whole life, you go back and read Samson's life. There were so many warnings in his life. God sent his parents to warn him that what he's doing is not right. He didn't heed. God sent his father-in-law to say that he didn't listen. When God sent the people, the, the, the Delilah who betrayed him over and over and over again, he did not listen to all these warning bells until God had to cause him to suffer pain, to have his eyes gorged out. It's as though like he was physically blinded because he has always been spiritually blind. And only when he was physically blinded was he able to see spiritually what God had installed for him. And many, many such examples in the Bible. And that's why C.S. Lewis made this statement, this wonderful statement. He says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And so what should we do, friends? What should we do? Would you write me the last point in your notes is this? Turn up your receptivity down. Turn up your receptivity down. You know, your, your receptivity, just turn it up. You know, like children. You know, I, I think my children, uh, sometimes they are a real handful, you know. They are they're up there now. And my wife will tell you they are a handful to them. Yeah, 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 I'm talking about you. <laughs> okay. You know, sometimes, you know, when it, when it comes time to sleep, it will always, we'll always go through this. Children, time for bed. Silence. It's as though they're, they're not even there. And you come up from the, I'm in the bedroom and say, Children, time for bed. Again, total silence. Children, did you hear me or not? They look at me, yeah. So come in, time for bed. You go back into the room, nobody follows you. And then, you call again and again, they still don't come. Until I go out and say, Children, you better come in before I count to ten. <laughs> Suddenly they're there. All three. I mean, all two, one, two, one, two, they're both there. Suddenly. Sometimes children are just like that. You know, they, 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 they just don't listen to you the first time. And well, like my children, what I'm trying to do now is I'm train, training them. I'm not doing a good job at it, but I'm training them that not only do you need to obey or listen to your parents, but you need to listen to them the first time round. You don't wait until I issue you a threat before you listen to what I say. And so I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying. I'm not success, successful, but I'm trying. But aren't we like that many times with God? And we won't listen until God gives a threat. Luke 24, 25, and he said to them, How foolish are you, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. How slow of heart are we? And we need to turn up the, receptive, the, the receptivity dial in our heart. And the only way to turn it up is through the practice of obedience. You see, friends, obedience takes practice. Like anything else in life, it takes practice. Like my children, yeah, they are threats. But they have learned through, obe through practice that when I stand there and I, stay, and I start counting, they will come immediately. Because they know there is danger when I start counting. And likewise for us. It's, and how, how did they learn that? It's because when they were very young, when my girl was very, very young, I taught her, okay, fine. Sometimes, because sometimes we are playing with you, you don't know when I'm serious, you don't know when I'm not serious, fine. But when I count to three 
and you are not and and that means I'm serious. And when I'm serious, you better be serious. And she has learned that from young. Why? Through practice and obedience. Through practicing obedience. And so now when she grows up, the brother also follows her automatically. I didn't, have to, I didn't, I didn't train the brother, but the brother follows by watching her. Because when the daddy counts, she runs, the brother realized, I better run also. And so he learned through practice. Likewise for us. We have to increase that receptivity dial in our hearts. It starts by obeying. Practice obedience. When God prompts your heart to do something, you need to just obey. Even though it's a small thing, start with small, small things in your life. God will prompt you every day. Even in a day, God may prompt you five, six times. Obey. When God prompts you, obey. When God prompts you, obey. You just, just keep practicing that obedience over small, small things. Later, when you go to the ranger hall and eat lunch and, and, have, and have lunch, God will prompt your heart. Hey, why don't you go and speak to that person? Just go and speak. Because you're practicing obedience. When you're taking food and then God will prompt you, hey, rather than eating this food, give this food to, to, to that brother instead. And just give that plate to that brother. Just prompt. Follow the promptings of God in your heart. And as you practice that form of obedience to follow the promptings, then you, what you're doing is you're increasing the receptivity of your heart. You're increasing your quickness to obey, your quickness to respond. So that when God speaks things into your life, when God speaks things that needs changing in your life, you respond instantly. Your heart moves quickly. You don't need to drag your feet. You don't need to wait for a warning bell. You don't need to wait for God to start counting one, two, three before you run. You respond immediately. In closing, we don't like hurts. We don't like pains. And it's often easier to give the excuse, God wants me to be happy, right? Than just to, to continue justifying our situation, to justify our condition, not wanting to do anything about it, not wanting to improve because we don't like the pain. But you see, friends, pain or the cause of pain is basically relative to the cause of it. The cost of pain is relative to the cause of it. Let me give you an example. If let's say, you know, my wife recently, she just climbed Mount KK, Kinabalu, Kota Kinabalu. I mean, Mount, Mount Kinabalu. She just went up to climb, climb Mount Kinabalu. Imagine I went up with her. I didn't, but imagine if I went up with her. And we were standing on the peak of Mount KK and we were looking at the sunrise and all that. And because the wind was so strong, the wind blew her head off and it fell down into a ravine. And you can see all the sharp rocks, the steep edges, and all the, 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 the trees with all the bushes and all the thorns and everything, and it's like a hundred feet drop down. And my wife looks at me and says, can you please get my hat for me? Okay lah, I love you lah, fine, I will do. Even though it's going to cost me my life, I may get injured. I will, you know, I will complain and say, no way, this, these stones will kill me, these shrubs will, will injure me, whatever, it, it, will, it, will, it will kill me, I will not go risk my life just for a stupid hat. Imagine this instead. If one of my children were to have fought down, fell down into that ravine instead, would I go down? Yes. doesn't matter whether it's gonna, the stones are there, the shrubs are there, the danger is there, it's going to cut me, it's going to hurt me, I may break an arm, I may break a leg, whatever it is, it doesn't matter, I will go down. Because the cause of it is much greater than the cost of pain. Likewise in our lives, friends. Many times we don't want to go through pain. We don't want to go through, we don't want to do things that we don't like. We don't want to go through things that make us uncomfortable, that inconvenient us. Because we have a different goal. Because for us, I just want to enjoy life. But if our goal is to be like Christ, if our goal is to, to, to be like God, to be in the plan of God, to follow what God wants, to, to fulfill all that God wants for me, the pain is not going to matter. The hurt it's not going to matter. Whatever that happens, it ain't going to matter. And when the one, and, and so you see, friend, pain is relative to the goal and to the objective. And if we, if we just live our life with the goal of enjoying life, then we will always say that God wants me to be happy and I don't ever want to improve. And when the warning bells comes and when we are challenged to grow beyond what we are, we will just keep brushing it off and say, after all, God wants me to be happy, right? Let us pray. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Saviour, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise, all the honour and all the glory. 
And Lord, we ask this morning that you come and speak to us once again. Help us to realize, Lord, that not everything that may hurt us, that not everything that may cause pain to us, not everything that may cause us to be unhappy is bad for us. But many times, in order for us to fulfill your plans in our lives, to be the person that you want us to be, very often, help us to realize, Lord, that we need to go through the pain. We need to go through the fire of that maturing process. Help us to realize that, Lord, so that we won't always go around and give the excuse to justify what we are doing, that because you want me to be happy. But we will be able to realize that, yes, you want me to be happy, not now, but you want me to be eternally happy when I'm with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.